I'm Peter Adamson, and you're listening to the History of Philosophy podcast, brought to you with the support of the Philosophy Department at King's College London and the LMU in Munich, online at www.historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode will be an interview about Michael Psellos with Dominic O'Mara, who is Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at Fribourg in Switzerland. Hi, Dominic. Thanks for coming back on the podcast. Hi, Peter. I'm going to start with a quote from Psellos, which is the following. I alone practice philosophy in unphilosophical times. What did he mean by that? And was what he was trying to convey a fair assessment of the context in which he was working? Yes, um, um, uh, we need to talk a little bit about what he means by doing philosophy or, or being a philosopher, and also what he means by unphilosophical times. Um, I think by unphilosophical times he means um, the circumstances in which he lives, which are unfavorable to philosophy. He obviously thinks that he lives in a society which, so to speak, does not leave much room for philosophy. But nevertheless, in these circumstances, he, he, he tries to practice philosophy. Um, but what is uh, this philosophy that he practices and why are his times unphilosophical? Um, he has a concept of philosophy which we need to think about a little bit because it's not really ours. Um, philosophy for Psellos is a very wide-ranging concept and uh, 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 my good friend John Duffy has identified it with polymathia, knowing many things. As if uh, for Psellos to do philosophy, to be a philosopher, is to know many things. It seems to be the reverse of what Heraclitus says when he denounces somebody who knows many things but doesn't understand anything. But for Psellos, knowing many things seems to be characteristic of philosophy. And uh, if you look at how he articulates philosophy, you see that it uh, comprises a whole series of sciences. There's metaphysics, there's mathematics, there's physics, there's what we might call psychology, ethics, politics, and even goes into uh, things like judicial science, uh, legislation, and rhetoric. Philosophy seems to be almost the same thing as knowing everything. And uh, Psellos uh, wrote for his um, his imperial pupil uh, uh, a little handbook called uh, De Omnifaria Doctrina, uh, which sort of means um, um, all sorts of knowledge. And in this little handbook, he has little chapters on practically everything you need to know about metaphysical principles, Christian principles, soul, body, the world, earthquakes, uh, um, um, hailstones, and, uh, and free will, and evil, and so on. So he has an extremely comprehensive concept of philosophy, and it seems to be the equivalent almost of being interested in everything and trying as far as possible to know everything. So what this means that for him to philosophize is in fact to, to master all of the known sciences, the sciences he could discover in a, in a period which did not at all uh, conform to this, this ambition of his. Does that mean that the opposition that he detected amongst his contemporaries had the form of being encouraged not to know everything? In other words, that there were only certain things you need to know, maybe only religious knowledge, for example? Yes, I think uh, at least one element probably is an implicit struggle with uh, certain monastic currents. In particular, currents uh, of monasticism, of monastic asceticism and spirituality, which uh, sought to uh, avoid, let's say, pagan knowledge or Greek science, and which uh, felt that uh, spirituality could be um, developed, should be developed in a kind of a, a renunciation uh, on reason. And so perhaps his emphasis on the richness, the variety the, of knowledge stands in contrast to the, so to speak, reduction of human reason to almost nothing and reliance on spiritual emotion, shall we say, uh, uh, cultivated by certain monastic movements of his time. 
So the opponent's idea would be that ascetic practice would be enough. It would get you to heaven. So you don't need all of this learning of rhetoric, science, metaphysics, and so on. That's right. There's a kind of a quick road to heaven and you don't need to go through philosophy. <laughs> yeah, and you, you need don't... to wall yourself up in a cell and not eat anything for That's right. weeks on end. So it's not that easy. But... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Maybe it hurts a little. <laughs> but one very interesting example of this is the way he talks about his mother. He wrote a uh, a speech uh, in praise of his mother uh, uh, at, uh, after her death. It's a funeral oration in praise of his mother. And his mother was um, uh, very religious, uh, so religious that uh, to all intents and purposes she, she tried to live like a nun, uh, although she was not a nun, uh, in her house. And uh, one of the results of this of her action was uh, as, a, as a, a spiritual fanatic, I would say almost, is, was to send her husband out, out of the house, and he had to become a monk in, in, in a monastery. Another thing she did was to practically starve herself. So as physical asceticism, so to speak, driven to really um, extremes, uh, the way uh, Epsilus describes it, it sounds really pretty bad what she did to her body. But in his, in his description of her spirituality, let's say of her mysticism, uh, Psellos um, has, has his mother use Plotinian ideas. It's very amusing. Uh, so his mother begins to Plotinize, so to speak, when she talks about union with God, as if Psellos had to recuperate this ascetic extremism practiced by his mother by giving it a kind of a philosophical um, uh, dimension to it. And that way of presenting his mother shows also his criticism of these extreme anti-intellectual um, uh, tendencies of asceticism of his time. That mention of Plotinus brings me to another question, though, which is that it, when he says there's all this learning that we could acquire, mm -hmm. we should be reading these books, we should be steeping ourselves in the knowledge of the ancients. Mm -hmm. you, you called it the knowledge of the Greeks just yes. now. But of course... When you talk about the Greeks, what you, I suppose, mean is pagans, yes. not people who write in Greek, because that's of course right. that's his contemporaries too. That's right. And isn't there a problem there for him to square the paganism of most of the texts he's interested in with his own Christian belief and the Christian belief of his society? Yes, there's, this is a, a, a very difficult problem, and uh, it's hard to give um, a simple, quick answer to it. Uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, Psellos subscribes to Christian doctrine and to the authority of Christian revelation and subordinates all knowledge to this authority. On the other hand, his, his um, evident love of knowledge, of philosophy in this very broad sense, which means he is curious about everything that he can find relating to all branches of knowledge, uh, leads him to the very rich field of pagan philosophy, in particular the pagan philosophy of late antiquity, uh, which can nourish his curiosity and which brings him all sorts of uh, uh, interesting uh, materials. Uh, this can get him into trouble because uh, uh, this is, of course, a pagan material which is uh, sometimes uh, in contradiction with Christian revelation. And uh, Psellus is walking a kind of a tight rope because on the one hand he tries to defend himself against the charge of heresy, in fact, or of being interested in, in unholy, dangerous things by the claim that uh, wisdom involves knowing everything, being interested in everything, and it is his duty, to the extent that he wishes to cultivate wisdom, to be interested also in non-Christian things, to find out about all of these things. On the other hand, he has to be make sure that he points out where, in fact, this pagan wisdom stands in con conflict with Christianity. And then he just says, this is absurd, or this is nonsense, or this is rubbish, and this is in contradiction with Christian authority. So he gives us all of this knowledge, and then he could say at the end, no, this is all nonsense. <laughs> he comes in at the end, and so it's not that he suppresses it as no. he's going along. He actually tells you everything it says, yeah. and then he tells you the bits that you should reject at the end. Exactly. And this is a curious exercise, but it's a kind of, um, it's a, I think, attempt to compromise between subscribing to the authority of Christian revelation on the one hand and 
and allowing himself to, to explore the riches of wisdom on the other. He also says, and this is a traditional idea that he picks up from the church fathers, that is that you can sometimes use philosophical arguments and ideas as a weapon against uh, heresy. So not only is it curiosity in itself that motivates them, but possibly also the idea that sometimes these things can be useful even to Christian theologians. I, th I think one thing that's striking about Psellos in particular is that we're quite familiar in a way by now at this point in the series with the phenomenon of members of the Abrahamic faiths using pagan material, mm -hmm. Aristotle, Plotinus, mm -hmm. for their own even theological purposes. Mm -hmm. so we can think about uh, thinkers in the Islamic world, thinkers in Latin Christendom. But what's unusual about Celos, I think, is that he actually goes for some of the pagan texts mm -hmm. that are most pagan yes. and most strikingly yes. difficult to yes. reconcile with Christianity. In particular, I'm thinking of Proclus yes. and the Chaldean oracles. Yes. And although, for example, Proclus was influential in Latin and Arabic, mm -hmm. it, he was influential in this very stripped down form mm -hmm. where you don't get lots of references to the pagan gods anymore. Mm -hmm. Instead, you get references to kind of abstract principles like the one or yes. the limit or soul. Yes. Um, can you try to explain how that could be, that some well, of us would sort of deliberately go for the material that's most difficult? Well, the thing I'm trying to say is that I don't think we have a coherent, consistent, defensible position in, in Psellos. He, he, is, uh, he is somewhere in between, so to speak, and it's quite dangerous. Um, because he does, he's very enthusiastic. He actually loves philosophy, I think, seriously. And he, he's full of admiration for Plato, and he thinks philosophy can solve all problems. Very, very ambitious. And this love of philosophy extends to and includes especially the philosophy of Proclus. And that includes the Chaldean oracles. And so he goes into all of this stuff, which is dangerous and totally useless, you might say, to Christian theologians. But Psellos um, persists. And I think that's one of the interesting things about him. He's living in a tension, in a sort of contradiction all the time. And I think this, this, this tension is not resolved, really. Another thing that's unusual about Psellos is that he's almost two authors, because there's the deeply philosophical side we've been talking about, and then there's also Psellos the historian. He's uh -huh. the author of the Chronographia, which is a work that's really been of more interest to historians than histor historians of philosophy, because it details the lives and achievements of a series of Byzantine emperors. So do you think that nonetheless this is a text that philosophers or historians of philosophy should take seriously? Is there any philosophy in it, so to speak? Um, I think I think the, the, the chronographia is not just history. It's, it's used by historians as a source of historical information. Uh, it's uh, information about uh, Psellus's time, about the emperors of his time, and it's a really interesting, so to speak, uh, chronicle of his times. All the more interesting in, in the sense that he is often at the heart of the events, and he knows often the people he's talking about. So it's an eyewitness uh, account of, 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 of Byzantine history at the time, imperial history. Uh, but it's, uh, historians have also recognized that it's not just history. It's something more than that. And uh, in my view, uh, Psellos, on the one hand, is telling a story about the use of political uh, uh, power and implicitly criticizing the way political power has been exercised by a series of Byzantine emperors. And this means bringing out, in fact, how political power should be exercised. On the other hand, I think he's also talking about himself and putting himself into this picture and showing his role in this series of events and how he, as a philosopher, is an actor in these political events, defending, in a way, his ambition to unite philosophy and politics. And is the ideal reader that he's envisioning also a politically engaged person who's supposed to maybe take a lesson from the way that Psellos acted or maybe take a negative lesson from the less attractive figures he represents? 
I think uh, that's a good question as to who, what readers he, he has in mind. But I, I think uh, reading it, you would, you would see implicitly that these uh, emperors all exemplify different uh, moral failings, which are also political failings, uh, reasons why uh, they fail, why they bring catastrophe to the Byzantine emperor. And they show that uh, the Shohap Psalos uh, try to engage in, in the political uh, machine, so to speak, right at the heart of it, in the court. And uh, the things, sorts of things that m made things go wrong, where his action could no longer be exercised. We were talking at the beginning of the interview about occasions, Cairo, circumstances which were unphilosophical. And circumstances keep changing, and in some circumstances the philosopher can act, in some, in some circumstances he can't. In fact, it becomes impossible. And this happened to Psellos. He, uh, he had to retire from the court and go to a monastery, hide in a monastery, so to speak, where he became Michael Psellos, um, because it was just impossible, too dangerous for him to stay in the court. Um, but he came back later on when he could, out of the monastery, back into the court in Constantinople to try to act further as a philosopher at the heart of political power in the Byzantine Empire. Maybe he was thinking about Plato's injunction to the philosopher to go back into the cave and try to bring wisdom to Certainly. the people. Yes, yeah. he, he, he quotes Plato on the subject and he says, uh, in antiquity, uh, philosophers did engage themselves in, in politics, uh, Plato, but also Pythagoras, also Aristotle, uh, but that this this link between philosophy and politics has, has been broken. And he obviously thinks that this is something that should be uh, reinstated, that the philosopher should involve himself in practical life, and in his case, in political life, to the extent possible. So you came on the podcast before, actually, to talk about late ancient political philosophy, and you were just referring now to Plato, Pythagoras, really ancient philosophers. Yes. But on the other hand, you've told us that Psellos was very interested in late antique figures like yes. Proclus. What are the themes and ideas of late antique political philosophy that Psellos can and does draw on in order to develop his own political views? Yes. Uh, for some preparatory remarks, Psellos um, has a Neoplatonic view of human nature. Uh, he thinks that human nature is made up essentially of the soul, which can exist independently of the body, and that this soul then comes in contact with the body, in relation with the body, and lives in this relationship. And corresponding to this distinction between uh, the human as soul in itself, or the human as soul in body, uh, he uses the distinction, an old distinction, between the theoretical life and the practical life. So the theoretical life is the life of soul in itself, and practical life is the life of soul with respect to the body. And corresponding to these distinctions is the distinction between theoretical philosophy and practical philosophy. Uh, practical philosophy itself uh, is made up of ethics, politics, and uh, Psellos talks about politics in a way which I think is influenced by people like Proclus, by philosophers of late antiquity, who describe political science in terms of two sciences, um, legislation and jurisdiction. And uh, these are parts of practical philosophy or political philosophy, uh, which uh, Psellos thinks are largely neglected or have practically disappeared at his time and that there has to be some work on bringing legislation and jurisdiction on a theoretical level into order. And this is the job of the practical philosopher or the political philosopher. What's the difference between those two parts? I, presumably legislation is the making of laws, is that's jurisdiction right. the enforcing the, of laws? That's right. So there's a kind of subordination. There is, on the one hand, a formulation of laws, and these laws should be, for, should be develop, developed for the good of the community. And uh, then jurisdiction sees that people are punished to transgress these laws, or let's say uh, jurisdiction uh, guards these laws from, from a violation. So it's a sort of secondary science uh, subordinated to legislation. And legislation itself is supposed to be an expression 
of the knowledge required for knowing how humans can live well, that is happily, in their incorporated state as part of a uh, community. I think uh, these ideas that we find in Psellos are, re are already to be found in Proclus. And um, Psellos was able to use Proclus in order to formulate what it is that uh, the philosopher, to the extent that he is political or practical, uh, should know in order to contribute in terms of knowledge to the political process. And is that really what makes the good politician a, a good politician? Just knowledge? There's nothing else you need? I mean, it's a very kind of platonic or maybe even Socratic idea of what makes a good ruler a good ruler. Um, in Psellos, it's, uh, it's a little tough because uh, he's living in a political system which is which is monarchical. It's uh, it's based on the structure of uh, monarchical power. And it's not like you can apply to become the Byzantine emperor. You can't. Here's my CV. I've, that's right. I've read lots of Plato. <laughs> that's right. It's 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 um, already uh, determined in terms of who has power by things like blood and, and things like murder and power and money and so on. Nothing to do with knowledge. So the criteria for the for the acquiring of power are quite different from those that Plato would, would, would specify, in other words, the criterion of knowledge. Uh, so given the fact that you're living in this system where um, knowledge doesn't count at all, but power does, or money or, or blood, um, the philosopher can intervene as a, an advisor. He can advise the emperor uh, in, terms of in terms of political policy. And this is precisely the role that Psellos gave himself. He was the philosopher with the knowledge who could advise the emperor in his policies. And the chronography, in fact, has chapters giving advice on, on how to rule to the emperor. That's how Psellos saw his action as, as a philosopher in the court. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you, you sort of, I think there's a tendency to assume that what philosophers really want to be doing is what they call contemplation, shutting yes. themselves away. And, yeah. and thinking about God or metaphysics or the yeah. soul. Yeah. And obviously, Psellos did quite a lot of that. Yeah. He was forced into it, in a yes. way, the life of contemplation. But I think it's interesting that he seems to have chosen an, a politically engaged life when he could. Does yeah. he have a worked out theory about why that's the right choice? I mean, can he give us a philosophical account of why the engaged political life, or maybe the life that involves both political engagement and contemplation, mm -hmm. is to be preferred to the life that involves only contemplation? Yes. Um, here again, as I, as I was speaking about the, the, t the uh, tight wire on which Psellus found himself with respect to the relation between Christian revelation and pagan learning, he's also on a tight wire with respect to the relation between contemplative and practical life. He fully uh, subscribes to the priority, the superior value of the contemplative life, of the life of pure knowledge without any action praxis. But on the other hand, he insists very much that he'd rather be involved in the practical life. Uh, and this has to do with um, his concept of being in the middle. Uh, he's, so to speak, in the middle between soul and body <laughs> in his life. He's a kind of intermediary. And he thinks uh, uh, his, his role is to mediate, so to speak, between contemplative and practical life. He's not, uh, he's not totally divorced from contemplative, contemplative life, and he admires it and has practiced it himself to some extent. But he thinks that his place in, in this life, so to speak, is to mediate uh, and to to make the junction between theory and practice, between contem contemplation and political action. He is also very interesting in terms of this insistence on on the middle between extremes, and in, in this case, the middle between soul just in itself and uh, and a soul which is completely plunged into bodily concerns. He wants neither, but he thinks a successful life in this life, in this incorporated life, is a life in the middle, so to speak, where soul is not the slave of bodily desires, but controls these desires. But on the other hand, soul does take care of its 
of its uh, corporeal condition. It does not abandon them and try to live, so to speak, by itself in another world. And he thinks that that would be the right choice for any embodied soul. It's not just a matter of taste that he likes to be engaged in politics. He thinks that every philosopher should, or even maybe would, as a true philosopher, would yeah. always get engaged in politics. I think he does, yes. He thinks the philosopher um, will have this concern to, to, to communicate. Uh, Psellus communicates in various ways. He's a teacher. He teaches in the court in Constantinople, and he's a very active teacher, very interested in teaching his, his pupils. And when he talks about his mother's extreme example, uh, he says that he can't meet up to her high standards of spirituality. He, he is uh, deficient with respect to these high standards. And he says it is his lot, it is his duty. In fact, uh, God has told him, the emperor has told him, his students tell him that he should teach, that she, he should communicate knowledge. So he, has a, he sees himself as a philosopher charged with the mission of, of uh, communicating knowledge to others. And this can be the knowledge that he communicates to his students philosophical knowledge in general, or perhaps more specifically, political knowledge that he can convey to the emperor. He is, as a philosopher, engaged at these various levels in this middle position between being totally enslaved to the body and totally ignorant on the one hand, on the other hand, being totally abstracted from the world and wrapped up just in some sort of transcendent uh, existence. Does he give us a more fleshed out picture of what the best ruler will do or what at least what characteristics the best ruler would have to have? For example, does he think that the best ruler would be an image of God and relate to the community the way that God relates to the universe or anything like that? I don't think so. Um, it's a, di- a little difficult because the conographia is, is not an entirely coherent piece. Uh, the, most of it is, is very interesting in the sense that it does not conform to the normal pattern of what is called the mirror of princes or the Fürstenspiegel. And it's only at the end, for the last emperor, that uh, Psellus practices this literary genre of the mirror of princes. And this literary genre of the mirror of princes makes the emperor into the image of God. You're referring to this idea. And that uh, uh, that as God rules the world, so the emperor should rule his his people, and therefore the emperor will exercise philanthropy, the love of men, just as God is uh, loves men. So these cliches of rhetoric, which come from uh, late antiquity, uh, in which uh, the picture of the ruler as an image of God is is. Um, uh, repeated again and again. Uh, this is taken up again by Psellus when he's referring to the emperor who reigned when he was finishing his book or coming to the end of his writing. But the earlier parts and the greater part of the chronographia is not like that at all because the emperor has come across as a pretty terrible crowd. They're, 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 they seem to exemplify almost all of the vices one could think of and some of them are really bad. So we're very far from here pandering to emperors. We're far from the mirror of princes. We have a kind of a critique of the various vices, including ignorance, uh, manifested by the different emperors and the catastrophic results of these vices on the population, the impoverishment of the empire, the misery of the population, the danger that this put the empire in with respect to its, uh, its enemies. The vices, you might say, of the emperors have brought to catastrophic consequences in terms of material goods for the for the people in in whose in whose name for whose good these emperors are supposed to be ruling. Does Psellus give us any idea why God saw fit to put this sequence of jerks on the (laughs) Byzantine throne? I mean, it seems like seems rather unkind. Is it a way of punishing? I mean, I think a lot of Byzantine intellectuals and theologians read the history of difficulties faced by the empire, you know, the Arab invasions, plague, earthquakes, you name it. They would often say, well, this is because of sin. It's because of sin rampaging through the community and we're being justly punished. That doesn't really sound like it would be Psellus' thought. No, I don't think that's his, his thought. Um, for instance, uh, when um, Procopius is denouncing the tyranny of Justinian, he says this is God's revenge. 
and other people blame all the catastrophes that uh, can happen uh, to the empire in terms of God's revenge. The collapse of Hagia Sophia of the Dome is blamed on on, on the viciousness, the vice of the of the people of Constantinople. For example, I don't think this is Psellus's line at all. Uh, he doesn't like um, divine intervention in the uh, in the order of nature. And he thinks that nature, this is also quite impressive, he thinks that nature has its own rationality. God is the cause of this rationality. But things happen in a certain order, and you could describe this, if you like, as fate or as providence. And maybe all the things that we go through and all of the terrible things that we happen, that we happen to have to undergo, again, these chiroi, these occasions, are figure in this larger picture of of fate and uh, the fact that there are all sorts of miserable emperors or vicious emperors of various kinds it's never quite the same <laughs> situation perhaps is part of a larger pattern of fate uh, in which we can try to intervene to some extent but of course which we cannot control ourselves um, I think it's he sees things more in that way than in terms of some sort of divine interventionism, so to speak, which he, he wishes to limit as much as possible. Okay, well, thanks very much, Dominic, for coming on to talk about Michael Psellus. You're very welcome. And please join me next time when you'll have another occasion to learn more about <laughs> Byzantine philosophy here on The History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. Oh.